So here is the review for exam four. And uh, the topics are, you had seen it a minute back. So electromagnetic waves was on the last, was not on the last exam. So that'll be there on this one. Mirrors, lenses, interference, diffraction. And then when I say the eye, I mean the defects of the eye, how they can be corrected. And optical instruments, I think we basically focused only on a telescope. Also remember that one of the essay questions is an image. I've told you that. 10 points is for an image. And you have various options. I can ask you to draw a diagram of a telescope. Need incredible practice on that. Image formation by mirrors and lenses, both types. What refraction is, critical angle, all that stuff. And we also did the lab, so be ready for that. So we'll go straight into this. Electromagnetic waves uh, is where the problem is going to be. Electromagnetic waves, one thing that you should uh, make sure you understand is the electromagnetic spectrum. And here you see the electromagnetic spectrum with the radio waves having the smallest wavelength. Wavelength is, I mean, the biggest wavelength. The wavelength is decreasing. Microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays have the smallest wavelength, right? And the ones that have the smallest wavelength, of course, have the highest frequency. So you know that. So because C is equal to F times lambda. And then this is a diagram just to give you a comparable size. Radio waves have about the size of buildings, and microwaves about the size of human beings. You understand that. But the size of gamma rays is the size of the atomic nuclei. So just a comparative size for you to understand. And frequencies are listed here. Good to know that uh, visible frequencies are like in 10 raised to 15. 10 to the power 15 is the frequency of visible light. And here, there is a comparison with temperatures also. So if you need to get these temperatures, you need to have it, I mean, these waves, you need to have it at that temperature. Wow. You see the temperature? If you are trying to produce them by heating, I'm not saying you can always. If you try, so that gives you a visual idea of how tough it is to produce gamma rays by heating. Do You see, that's what I'm trying to say. So these, yeah, you can produce uh, high temperature high frequencies. So that's about electromagnetic waves. And then I wanted to focus on the vis uh, wavelengths in the visible region. This is exactly what you're doing today. You're trying to find the wavelengths of different colors. You, you know that it extends from 400 nanometers in the violet to a little more than 700 in the red. You know that, right? So this is what we are measuring today. And ultraviolet has a wavelength less than 400 nanometers, while infrared has a wavelength more than red, of course. Remember the words ultra. What do you mean by ultra? Does it mean higher or lower? Higher. higher. It means higher. That means the naming is not according to the wavelength. It's according to the frequency. Because mm -hmm. you can see here that ultraviolet has a wavelength less than violet. So, it's called ultra because the frequency is higher. Do you hear me? So the naming is according to the frequency, not according to the wavelength. Why? The frequencies are more important. Remember in light, the frequency does not change when light goes from one material to another, but the wavelength changes. Do you remember that? So frequencies are consistent, so we focus more on frequencies. Here are some equations, Maxwell's equations that we looked at. How many equations are there? Maxwell's. Oh, you counted. I knew. I put five, so I knew you would count and say five. There are only four equations. Four equations, and I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it's written there. This is Gauss's law in electrostatics, right? What does this term stand for? What is integral E dot dA? Uh, electric flux. Electric flux is equal to one by epsilon naught times the total charge enclosed. This is Gauss's law for magnetism. Magnetic flux is zero. Why is the magnetic flux zero? Be Be exactly, because magnetic lines are closed. So it does not start from a north pole and end on a south pole. It goes back. So 
there's no flux coming out, that's why it's zero. This is Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. I think you realize that the induced EMF is the negative of the rate of change of magnetic flux. Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. This is, why is it called Ampere-Maxwell law? Because it's actually Ampere's law, which is corrected. Ampere's law is just this first term. This is an addition by Maxwell. We talked about this in detail, you know, although you don't remember pretty much. And so that's Ampere-Maxwell's law, Ampere's law, with this one being the addition and that part is called the displacement current, so that's why I had it here. Displacement current. What is displacement current? The current produced by a charging or discharging capacitor. That's called a displacement current. That's why you have those epsilon naught and d phi e by dt coming in. So those are Maxwell's equations because you make the formula sheet. I'm sure you're going to write all this down, but please, when you write it, Think about it. Think about what each term stands for. What's the meaning of that? Think about the units. It'll do you good. And then there are some more equations here. This is, of course, a repetition. Wave equation for a plain electromagnetic wave. I uh, just want you to look at this and see on the left-hand side, it's uh, what is the differential here? Second order, change in electric field with distance, isn't it? But on the right side, you have change in electric field with time. Don't go into the details of that, but you, do you see an important factor coming up here? Epsilon naught times mu naught. This is an electrostatic property. This is a magnetic property, right? And that's why you know, I uh, hope you remember this formula. The speed of electromagnetic waves is 1 by square root of those two terms multiplied. This is a very important idea. Now, remember, this can be E by B or E naught by B naught. What is E naught? The maximum of the electric field, and B naught is the maximum of the magnetic field. So the peak value. So you can either take the ratio of the instantaneous values or take the ratio of the peak values. This is called the Ponting vector. Anybody remembers at least the word? Ponting vector. What does it stand for? Shows the energy flowing per second per unit area. The energy carried by an electromagnetic wave per second per meter squared is given by this vector called the Ponting vector. It's 1 by mu naught E cross B. That's not E times B, it's E cross B. It's a cross product. And then the average, the last one, the average intensity of an electromagnetic wave can be just focused on the last formula, E naught, B naught by 2 mu naught. We have worked out problems in this chapter. We have. You remember? At least four or five problems have been worked out, so pay attention to that, and it will be good. Refraction. When you talk about refraction, you talk about the law of refraction called Snell's law. Everybody remembers what's Snell's law? N1 sine theta 1 is equal to N2 sine theta 2. Now, just knowing that is not enough. You have to know that theta 1 is the angle measured in N1, and theta 2 is the angle measured in N2, because I can reverse it. And then I've seen people, they just get confused, because they won't read. They will go by N1 sine theta 1. I will reverse it. Be careful about that. OK. When light goes from a less dense, yeah? So a solid line denotes a border between two different mediums, right? No. Nope. dashed line. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. This is the, the line between the two materials or medium. This is the normal. That's the perpendicular. As drawn there. I know you made that mistake. Yeah. Don't make that again. Okay. So that is refraction. Now, refractive index. Give me three definitions for refractive index. Three definitions. I want three definitions for refractive index. So refractive index of glass, for example. Speed of light in? Speed of light in air divided by the speed of light in glass. That will give you the refractive index of glass. So that's one definition. So you want the refractive index of any material 
you just divide the speed of light in air by the speed of light in that medium. So what's the refractive index of glass? 1.5. So which means the speed of light in glass is two, two times slower. Yeah, two times 10 to the 8. Because in air, it's three times 10 to the 8, right? So 3 divided by 2 is 1.5, is what I'm trying to tell you. So what is the second definition? From Snell's law. Can't you find it from Snell's law? But I was trying to say, OK, now they might get confused. So I just wrote this down. And I said, if it is Snell's law, you actually mean this n is n2 by n1, with n1 being 1 for a. So it's the same meaning. So, you know, it's like the same thing. And this is the third one. I know you did that in the lab with the traveling microscope. How did you find the refractive index? Real depth over apparent depth. Yeah, that's what the diagram shows. The real depth of this object, P, is HO. HO standing for height of the object. And HI is the height of the image. And you should be able to draw such images too. If I ask you, can you draw an image where, I've asked students this, like a coin underwater and show how refraction makes it appear at a height. Many cannot do it. But that's how you do it. Is that clear there? Is the diagram clear? It is. The bending makes it appear as if uh, the object is here while it's actually here. See? So the real depth divided by the apparent depth gives you the refractive index. So that's, those are the three definitions of refractive index. So knowing that the refractive index of water is 1.33, if the actual height of a swimming pool is 4 meters, how much will it appear to be when you estimate it from outside? Three meters, which is a big change. That's a 25% decrease, isn't it? So trying to estimate the height of a swimming pool from outside is dangerous because you're going to see it drastically reduced. And you jump in, and you don't know to swim. That's the last time you jump in. OK, so I thought. OK. Critical angle. Now, when you talk about critical angle, what how is light traveling? Is it traveling from less denser to more denser, or no, more to less? It stays in the same material. No, no, no. It's more than more, it has to be going, look at that, look at the diagram. N2 and N1, I'm asking you which refractive index is greater, N2 or N1 is what I'm asking you. N1. Definitely N1 is greater than N2. So total internal reflection happens only when the light is trying to go from more dense to less dense. Got it? More dense to less dense. Like light is trying to escape from diamonds into air, or from an optic fiber into air. You see, you have to understand that. It's, it's not when it's trying to go from air into the optic fiber. It has to be when it's trying to go from the optic fiber into air. So more dense to less dense. And then the critical angle. How do you define the critical angle? Isn't it the angle of incidence for which the angle of refraction is what? 90 degrees? So if you apply Snell's law there, you're going to get a formula. And of course, you're going to get n1 sine theta c is equal to n2 sine 90. Isn't it? Yeah, n1 sine theta c is n2 sine 90. And then sine 90 is 1. So that's something that will let you find the critical angle. And then here is total internal reflection. Notice that the two angles are equal because it's reflection now. And also notice that for, to, uh, for total internal reflection to happen, the angle of incidence must be greater than the critical angle. Okay? So what are the two conditions for total internal reflection? Number one. The ray must be going from more dense to less dense. Number two, the angle of incidence must be greater than the critical angle. 
for that material, okay? Then, image formation by a plane mirror. You should be able to draw. Uh, it'll be really silly if you cannot draw a plane mirror and show how it forms an image. It'll be really silly. You can't. And if I ask you that, you know. What is the law of reflection? The angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And that all three lie in the same plane. What do I mean by all three? The incident ray, the reflected ray, and the perpendicular that you draw to the surface all lie in the same plane. So you can see that here. You can see that here, although the perpendiculars are not drawn. See, if I drew it, then you would need see that the, the incidence angle is equal to the angle of reflection. See that? What kind of image is this? Is it real or virtual? Virtual. Can you see a virtual image? Yes. Can you produce it on a screen? No. Remember that always. What you see is a virtual image. What you see on a screen is a real image. So right now what you see, this projector projecting, is a real image. But when I see you all, it's a virtual image because I see you, although it's on the screen of mine. And what is the, uh, what is the relation between DO and DI? Still equal? Still equal? Thank you. Somebody said negative. Thank you. DO is equal to negative DI. If you still say it's equal, you're still like the common people. You know, like, oh, there you go. Okay, half the attention. But if you say DO is equal to negative DI, that makes sense. Because if DO is equal to DI, it makes no sense. That means the image should have been exactly where the object is. But here the image is the same distance, but behind. Isn't that a big difference for physics students? It's not like, oh, is that the same? No, it's not. You can argue with me the whole day. Mm. And when you come to lenses and mirrors, I hope you understand that. Let's check it out according to the diagram. Convex lenses behave like which mirror? Concave mirrors. Concave mirrors. So convex lenses and concave mirrors have the same properties. While concave lenses and convex mirrors have the same properties. It's either you know it or you don't. I mean, take the guesswork. So what are those properties? Let's focus on a convex lens first. Is its focus real or virtual? Convex lens. There you go. Now, now we have to struggle. Now we have to like guess. A convex lens has a real focus. Its focus is real. That means if a parallel beam of light falls on a convex lens, it will converge it, actually converge it. See, I used another word. A convex lens is also called a converging lens. So when I give you a problem and I say it's a converging lens and you do not know what it means, you're stuck. You have to know a convex lens is a converging lens. Why should you know that? Because F is positive. Focus is real. That's very important in your calculations. Now, because the focus is real, it can produce both real image and virtual image. Now, in this diagram, what kind of image is that? Is that real or virtual? It's real. It's real. Because the rays are actually meeting here, right? It's a real image. And so you know that any image has four properties, do you? Yeah, it has the nature, which is either real or virtual, its size, its position, and the type. What do I mean by type? Is this upright or inverted? So that's what I mean by type. Then you know it's, it's position, right? And you know it's uh, magnification. We'll come to that soon, but all right. So I've written both of that down. A convex lens can produce both real and virtual image, but a concave lens can produce only virtual image. Why? Because it has a negative focal length. That's a concave lens. Is that clear? One more question before I leave this. So, can a convex lens produce a virtual image? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Where should the object be? Exactly. Inside the, the focus. Yeah, between the lens and the focus. So just remember that also. Okay. 
And then um, murderous is exactly the opposite, so I need not waste a lot of time. I just, I'm going to write that. Concave has a focus which is positive. Are you with me? Concave mirrors produce both real and virtual image, while a convex has a negative focus and it produces only virtual image. Okay, so that's about mirrors. You have to know how to draw diagrams, I'm telling you, because there are many things I can ask you. So that's my purpose. I want you to learn everything if you want to get those 10 points. Do you want a uh, representation? From there, you know the, the law of distances, 1 by DO plus 1 by DI is 1 by F, and magnification is HI by HO, or magnification is negative DI by DO. Here is a problem. Can I say that all real distances are positive, and all virtual distances are negative? Can I say that? No. That is correct. Any real distance is positive. Any virtual distance is negative. So if you get DI is negative something, is that a real image or a virtual image? Virtual image. Now, the, you might be confused the way I asked it, because when it comes to magnification, you have to kind of remember there's a negative already here, right? So two negatives make a? So if it's a real image, Will the magnification be positive or negative? If it's a real image, negative. negative. If it's a virtual image, magnification will be positive. There's absolutely no confusion for those people who have been listening to me and who are now listening. There's no confusion. <laughs> right, let's go over those. What's the lens maker's equation? What are those terms? What do they stand for? F is the focal length of what? Of course, it's a lens maker's equation, so it's for a lens. What's N2 and N1? N1 is the refractive index of the material of the lens. N2 is what it's surrounded by. You mix that up, and then you're gone again. So N1, material of the lens. N2, the surrounding. What is R1 and R2? The radius of curvature of both the surfaces, and I see. I took pains to draw that beautiful diagram that gives you an idea of what each one is. That is what it is. That is lens maker's equation. All right? And then, I defects. So what defect do you see? I'm sure it's somewhere. What defect do you see here? It says lens is too strong. See, if the lens is too strong, and it's a convex lens, isn't it? The eye lens is basically a convex lens. So if the eye lens is too strong, wouldn't it converge before the retina? Mm -hmm. So that causes short sight or hyperopia. See that? Oh, sorry, short sight or myopia, sorry. Short sight is called myopia. I said that one more time, OK. Uh, it also can be due to the eye being too long. So there are two reasons here, at least two reasons. The lens is too strong, or the eyeball is elongated along which axis? X or Y? X. X axis. And so how do you correct it? It's uh, too much converged in both of these cases, do you see? So you need a lens that will take it further away, which is a concave lens. So myopia is corrected using a concave lens. You see that here. It, the focus was in front of the retina, but when you use that diverging lens, it pushes it further back and gets it back onto the retina. Clear enough, right? It's very clear. But then when you come to long sight, uh, the lens is too weak, or the eye is now elongated along the y-axis. So now what happens is the focus is behind the retina. You see the difference? It's behind the retina. So now you need a convex lens to correct that. You need a converging lens. So that's why hyperopia or long sight is corrected using con. Everybody can say con. Convex lens. And then the calculations that come here uh, just be careful for the next five minutes. What is the near point of a normal human eye? 25. 25. 
what is the far point of a normal human eye? Infinity. Infinity. Okay, I thought I should write that. Near point is 25, far point is infinite for a normal eye. But what happens is, the near point becomes x centimeters and the far point stays at infinity for long sight. Check it out with me, don't just write, is that correct? You know, I couldn't make mistakes because I'm just writing that fast, yeah. Is that true for long sight, hyperopia? Can long sighted people see distant objects clearly? Mm -hmm. Yes, they have a problem when they read the newspaper. They have to hold it like this. You remember that? So the problem for them is with the near point. Their near point is not 25 centimeters. Instead, it is something else. It is like one meter or two meters. So that's why I put an X there. Is X more than 25? Less than 25. Mm -hmm. oh, nobody's hearing me? Is X more than 25? Less than 25? No. More than 25. So how would you find out the lens required, the focal length of the lens required? First of all, tell me which lens is used to correct long sight? Long sight is what we're talking about. Long sight, convex lens. And you just put it into this idea. So when the object is at 25, the image must be at X. All right, they have to read a newspaper. They have to hold it here, right? No, they have to hold it. Uh-uh. When, when they wear the lens. Oh, they wear the lens. When they correct it, they should be able to hold it at 25. So what is the lens doing? The lens will produce the image of that object at X, wherever the X is. See that? And then the eye lens will take it over from there. So that's why I've written this. And uh, again, this is review, so I have to go fast. So that's why I wrote 1 by 25 plus 1 by X is 1 by F. And then I gave... A form, an approximate, I said, let's, let's take X as 100 centimeters. Wow, this is very crucial. Is this image a virtual image or a real image? Virtual. Virtual. We're not talking about a screen. We're talking about them seeing. So, X is what? Negative. Negative. Because when you say the image should be produced at X, so you have to put it as minus X because it's a virtual image and all virtual distances are to be taken as negative. That's why when you put it into the formula, you get 1 by 25 minus 1 by 100 is 1 by F. Can you calculate that quickly and tell me what F is? You calculate F, you get 33.3 centimeters. I did not write it, but can I ask you this? How do you define the power of a lens? The power of a lens is the reciprocal of its focal length. And if you put a period there, you got it wrong. When the focal length is taken in meters. So the power of a lens is the reciprocal of its focal length when the focal length is taken in meters. What is the unit of power? Diopter. So that means if the focal length is one meter, the power is one diopter. Because one by one is one. If the focal length is half a meter, then the power is two diopters. Yeah, so it's the reciprocal. So as the focal length becomes smaller, the power becomes bigger. Okay, that's what, what you mean by reciprocal. Okay, so we were talking about long sight. Now let's talk about short sight. Is that again? That's a diagram of long sight again. I don't know, we don't need that again. Short sight. What is the problem with uh, short sighted people? Those who have myopia. Is the problem with the near point or far point? Far point. Far point, instead of being infinite, is x. Right? They can only see up to a certain distance. All right? So that's what I'm writing. Near point, there is no problem. Their near point is 25, but their far point is x. Mm -hmm. Correct? Therefore, the object... Come on, help me out on that. When they keep the object at... They can only see up to X centimeters, okay? Like, let's say, 100 centimeters. So if you want them to see up to infinity, what should you do? You should wear, they should wear contact, yeah, contact lenses. Or concave lenses, right? That's what I was about to say. So what does the concave lens do? You have to think, see, this is the problem. Without the lens, they can only see up to 
100 centimeters, all right? So when they wear the lens, they should be able to see up to infinity. So they are seeing up to infinity. So where is the object? At infinity. Where is the object? At infinity, because they are able to see up to infinity. Are you with me? So the object is at infinity. Where should the image be? At X. Thank you. This is where students go wrong. Because they're not thinking. They're like memorizing. If you memorize, physics doesn't work. So when the object is at infinity, the image must be at x. So once again, using the formula, do is infinity, isn't it? Yeah. So when you put it into that, that's an easier calculation, because 1 by infinity is 0. So of course, f is equal to minus. Why minus again? Because once again, the image is virtual. So could I ask you a multiple choice question and say, hey, a short-sighted person can only see up to 300 centimeters. Can you quickly tell me what's the power of the lens required? A person, I want a number, I want a number. A person can only see up to 300 centimeters. What's the power of the lens? I want a perfect number and a correct number, go. You remember the double slit? And the distance between them is little d, and this is taken as, no, we never used it as x. It was L. Uh, okay, so I, I think I'm changing it. And this is a point p on the screen. What is the path difference? What is the formula for path difference? You know, you have to draw a perpendicular from here. That would be the path difference, right? But what is the formula for path difference? It's d sine theta. And the condition for brightness is d sine theta is m lambda. Okay, what are uh, the values that M can take? Okay, if it takes value zero, you're talking about the central bright band. Just remember that. So that's the condition for brightness. What is the condition for darkness? Well, M plus one half lambda. That's the condition for darkness. And then uh, um, I just related this to the distance on the screen. You see the distance on the screen is Y, right? Isn't this what we got? m lambda d by the length. Now I change this to n. That's the distance between the source slits and the screen. So if you remember this, and you know what you're doing, you should be able to read the problem. Read the problem again. It does, there's very less chance that it's direct substitution. You know what I mean? So it's like you have to read the question. Is there a cat somewhere? And then apply the formula. OK. Diffraction. But diffraction you have to study in two different cases. Number one, diffraction at a single slit. What do you remember? about? What did I tell you about diffraction at a single slit? That the condition for darkness and brightness gets switched. That happens only in this case. And therefore, what is the condition for darkness? Yeah. What is equal to m lambda? Caps D, and that's why I'm using caps D. All the textbooks use caps D, so you don't get confused. Caps D sine theta is equal to M lambda is the condition for darkness. What are the differences between interference bands and diffraction bands? I think you remember that the intensity of the bright bands keeps decreasing, see? But in interference, all the bright bands have the same. kind of the same intensity, not exactly the same. And that you can see on this graph here again. Look at the intensity of this one. That's the central one, the first one. Second one is less. The third one is even less. So understand all that when you prepare for the exam. And this is our lab for the day. We're using a diffraction grating. What's a diffraction grating? Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that one. <laughs> it's a glass plate with uh, slits on it, right, with lines on it. And so I introduced something called A and B. A is the width of one slit. B is the width of one opaque region. Between the slits, don't you have an opaque part? So A plus B is called the grating element. And therefore, this is the formula for, ah, you already saw it. Is this the condition for brightness or darkness? This is the condition for brightness. So you go back to the same thing. It's only for the fraction of a single slate that it's reversed.
Okay, so that's the condition for brightness. But how do you relate this to the number of slits in one meter? What is the relation between A plus B and caps N? Caps N is the number of slits in one meter. So what's the relation between them? How many A plus Bs are there? So N times A plus B should give you one. There are N A plus Bs in one meter. Are you listening? So N times A plus B should give you one. Or A plus B is one by N. So when you substitute, you get this formula. Sine theta is Nm lambda. That's called the grating law. That is called the grating law. And I think you know, what is N? Number of slits. Some people will stop with number. Some will stop with number of slits. Some will go ahead and say number of slits in one meter. Now, that's how the grade changes. You know, when you study, what's N? When you prepare for the exam, that's how some students prepare. N, number. Oh, they're very happy. It's useless. You're just wasting time. Even if you go number of slits, not enough. If you go number of slits in one meter. So when you make that formula sheet, please spend time. Don't just copy it from a text. Say to yourself loudly what each letter stands for, including the unit. Are you, that's a good review. Okay. What is M? What is it called? Because of the problem, I'm going to say, order of spectrum, and you will be like, what is that? M is called the order of the spectrum. So if M is equal to 1, it's the first order. If M is equal to 2, it's the second order. See, I have to teach you how to count now. <laughs> Just, you know what I mean? So if I say second order, M is equal to 2. All right, so lambda. So that's what we're going to use today. Last topic, resolution. What is the condition for two images to be resolved? What is that great scientist's name? I'll be surprised. Surprise me. Go ahead. <laughs> Somebody gave a criteria for resolving two images. And the, <laughs> and the criteria was if the, the central maximum of one, do you remember? is at least incident the first minimum of the second is resolved. Rayleigh's criteria. Rayleigh criteria, okay. So that's what I'm talking about. You see two sets of like, fraction images, central maximum of one falls at least on the first minimum of the other. Are you with me? And that's the picture there again. Are these resolved? No, they look like one. Are these resolved? Yes. Are these resolved? Maybe yeah. just. We can't make it out. You know, if the center is falling on the first one, yes. It's like you have to slip the more, you know. So that's the Rayleigh criteria. And remember that because it's a circular aperture, remember? Telescopes don't have a rectangular aperture. So we use the factor 1.22 lambda by D. What's D there? What's D? Oh, yeah, because it's circular. Now you can't say width of the slit. Some will be waiting for the width in the problem. It's due to many factors that our grades go down, but I can summarize them into one factor, not clearly understanding. And that theta is going to be in radians. Right? That theta should be in radians. Good question, good point. Theta must be in radians there. If you keep it in degrees, oh, uh, you. Thank you so much.